He is so good. That's what we're learning in this whole generous series. It is based on Proverbs 11.25. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are so generous. And we bind the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. We bind his stinginess. We bind uh, the greed, Lord, all of that. We bind every plan that he has and strategy against your people, Lord. And we loosen your power, Lord, that you will work through us and in our midst, Lord, as we go out and we tell people about how generous you are in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Yeah. All right. Well, my hope for you is that you would receive what God's word has to say about giving in this whole series and that you would apply it to your life so you would prosper in every way. That's my hope for you. Now, there's parables and then there's historic events that happen. And today I want to share with you something that happened with the disciples. And uh, Jesus used the, the moment at hand for a teaching moment. And there's a lot in this to, to really get to. But I want to let you know today that it's never too late to be generous. It's never too late. And we see this in Mark 6, 35. It says, by this, by this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in the groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves then he gave them to his disciples and set before the people. He also divided the two fish among all, them all, and they ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the twelve baskets fulls of broken pieces of bread and fish, and the number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. And that's the word of the Lord. That's, that, that really happened. And just to let you know, if there was 5,000 guys, you know, you figure some of those guys were married. You know, some of them had children, and I'm sure they were along. So, you know, the, the Lord is being really conservative when he's given that number, 5,000. Now, that seems real generous, doesn't it? 5, 000, but there was more than just 5,000. And I want to let you know that it's never too late to really see the generosity of God. Amen. It's never too late. And what we see in this whole passage is the disciples make excuses, don't they? They make excuses, and they're telling the Lord this excuse and that excuse. And I can just imagine the Lord standing there and him just looking and, and saying something like this. We know he didn't say this, but I just, you know, it's in my mind. Just his reaction would be, excuse me? Excuse me? Because here they are making excuses to the Lord himself. Now, you know what? We're a lot like the disciples, ain't we? Amen. We're a lot like them because we make excuses at times, don't we? We make excuses about, you know, about the Lord being generous and how that can happen. For instance... They said, it's too far. We make an excuse that being too far. They said in Mark 6.35, this is the message, we are a long way out in the country. We're a long way out. Now, you, have you ever been there where you made an excuse? Well, I, you know, I'd love to stop and help that person with change that flat tire, but you know, we're a long way out in the country here. It's a long ways away. I don't know. We don't know who that person is. And you can get to making excuses that it's just not the right place to be generous, right? It's just not the right place. Have you made an excuse like that before? Oh, we're too far away from home. We're too far away from home. We just can't do that. You know, 
If, if we were closer to home, maybe, and you start making excuses. But I want to let you know today, it's never too far out for miraculous generosity from the Lord. No matter where you're at, it's never too far away for the Lord to do something miraculous through you. Here's another excuse we make. It's too late. It's too late. Mark 6.35, this is from the King James Version. The time is far past. The time, that sounds so, you know, the time is far past. That's King James right there, isn't it? You can could, you could tell, that's, that's here, you know, that's, that'd be like something a king would say or some elite person would say, the time is far past. Well, that's just, a, that's just another way of saying, well, you know what, time's up, it's too late. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bother. You know, and that's what the disciples were, they were feeling it, they were thinking it. They expressed it to Jesus. It's too late. It's too late. I'm tired. We've been at this all day. These people, just send them home. Get rid of them. Just send them home. You know, we're tired. We just want to go to bed. You know, have you felt like that? Where there's just one more thing. One more thing. Someone stops in, wants, to, wants your help or something. You get a phone call and you're tired and you just want to go to bed. Right? And what's your, what's your na natural response? It's too late. Right? It's too late. Well, with the Lord, it's never too late. Right? Amen. It's never too, too late for a miraculous miracle. You know, a mir miracle that is just happens where generosity just births forth and springs forth. Miraculous generosity. A miracle like that. It's never too late with the Lord. And there's always that excuse, well, it's just too much. It's too much. And in Mark 37, 637, it says that that would take eight months of a person's pay. Like Jesus couldn't do the math, you know. Should we go and spend that much on bread? Are we supposed to feed them? <laughs> they're, saying, they're asking this to Jesus. Should we go spend that much on bread? You know, sometimes we get caught up in the numbers. Sometimes we get caught up in how we're gonna how we're gonna pay for that. How is that gonna happen? How are we gonna be able to do that? That costs way too much. We can't we can't feed everyone a happy meal. We can't we can't give everyone you know a donut. We can't do that. There's just no way. But that's what that is is your thinking in your own terms. You're thinking in your own terms. Now, it's, we can always make the excuse, well, it's just too much. It's not the right amount. It's, but it's never too much for miraculous generosity. Actually, when it's too much, that's when miraculous generosity happens, right? That's when the Lord really moves because you can't do it in your own power. Eight months of working, you know, that, hey, you can't do that all in your own power right in the moment. And so we make excuses, but when we make excuses, we limit what God can do in a miraculous way right through us. You know, excuses are born when we limit God. We make excuses, and when we do, we limit God. We limit God. Now, I want to share with you seven principles from this context that if we just take these principles and apply them to our lives, we can see miraculous generosity really manifest itself in our lives. And I'm talking about miraculous, okay? I'm talking about miraculous. Now, the first thing is generosity comes from the heart. That's the first principle that we really got to get to. And in verse 37, Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And that's when they said to him, that would take eight months man's wages. Yeah. Jesus made it a point. You give them something to eat. Now, too often we want God to do all the giving. Too often we expect God just to do it all without our involvement. Well, you know what? And God is saying to us, no, you, 
You give. I want you to be a part of this. You give and watch what happens. Watch what happens. We make excuses why we shouldn't give all the time. And excuses are, are born when we limit God. Like I said, and excuses really, what excuses do, they expose the willingness of the heart. You ever notice that? When they said that, you know Jesus knew what was in their heart. Jesus said to himself that out of the abundance of the mouth, it comes from the heart, right? It comes from the heart. And here their excuses are coming. It's coming from their heart. Their heart wasn't willing. The heart was hard-hearted in the disciples, and they weren't willing. So don't look at what you don't have. Because that's really w what we end up doing. We, it's so easy to look at what you don't have to make an excuse not to give. That takes, you know how much money that takes? That's eight months of wages. That's eight months worth. That's a lot. I can't do that. And so don't look at what you don't have. Jesus wants us to first give out what we do have. Amen. Not from what we don't have. God will never ask you to give what you don't already have. He wants you to start with what you, what, you don't, what you have. If you can't give out of what you have, how will you ever be able to give out of pure faith? Amen. You know, I know a brother who the Lord put it on his heart. And, and he, the Lord put it on his heart. He was a businessman and and this was a real stretch for him that the Lord asked him to give a million dollars. Million dollars to this ministry. And he was like, hmm. But he got all excited. He got all excited and he was ready. And he said, he came home to his wife and he said, honey, we're going to give a million dollars for that ministry. And it was way out of their realm. But they both decided we're going to just do that if that's what the Lord said. They prayed and, yep, it was confirmed. The Lord said that. And so they just trusted the Lord and they started with what they had. And in the process, the Lord kept blessing them and blessing them and blessing them with more. And then someone came and offered. They, at the end of this, they, they ended up with more much more than a million dollars than, than what they had before to give. And so they, were, they gave the, Lord, the, the ministry a million dollars. They, they gave it out to the Lord, and they were blessed with even more. But they started out with what they had. We don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to go through and do it. Now, we're, the Lord's probably not going to tell you to give a million dollars. But if he did... I know he would make a way if you just step out in faith and follow him. God doesn't ask anything of you that he hasn't already given you. That's how he works. He's so good. He's so good. Now the next principle is you have to take inventory to give generously. You got to take inventory in what you have. Mark 6, 38 and this is the message says, how many loaves of bread do you have? Take an inventory. So that's the first response that Jesus gave them after he said, you give. He, he said, how many loaves of bread do you have? I want to work with what you got first. I want, what do you have? What do you have? Then take inventory. We can be a lot like the disciples in many ways. We can, we can send people away to another place for someone else to help them, right? And sometimes that's a good thing because we don't, we just, that some, some places have a better, a better way of helping people, okay? This, it's, it's not a bad thing to send people to, you know, like uh, Teen Challenge or Underground Railroad to take them there and, and put them in the hands of caring people who love them and there's a ministry already there. I'm not talking about that, but sometimes we can send people away when we actually have the resources and the means to help them. We might already have some loaves and some fish, right? Take inventory. Taking inventory is a biblical principle. The inventory of the tabernacle. Moses commanded that they take an inventory 
of the tabernacle. That's in Exodus 38, verse 21. And they were to go through and take inventory of the tabernacle. Now, how much more of inventory should we take being New Testament saints? Being the tabernacle of God, actually. Right? How much more should we take inventory? You know, not only taking inventory of our finances, but taking inventory of our lives. What's in our lives? The way we live our lives. You know, it's not all about the money. Jesus kept saying it's about the heart, right? So we have to take inventory of our heart. Of our heart. You know, there's something big that happens every year in Freeland. You know, the walleye fest, right? And really, it's not about the fish. It, it's become more about the rummage sale, right? The big rummage sale. So during that week, everyone's taking inventory that wants to have a rummage. They're taking, they're going through their attic, they're going through their basement, they're going through the closet, they're going through all that stuff, and they're taking inventory to find out what do they have to sell? What can they get rid of? And it's amazing how many things you find that you really don't need but is worth something. And that's what you see in the rummage sales. A lot of, there's a lot of nice stuff in some of the rummage sales. And we can take inventory. And there's sometimes we find stuff that isn't such, you know, it, it's just junk. And it's like you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe, maybe if I just put for free, someone will come and stop in and take it. Just take it off my hands. And... You know what, some of us have good things in our heart that we need to take inventory, good things in our life, and, and, and there are some areas you probably find some things that probably shouldn't be there that you would just love to get rid of, right? You know, you gotta take inventory of your heart. If you have any bitterness in your heart, any, any kind of rebellion, any kind of unforgiveness, any kind of greed in your heart, well, you know what, that, those are things that you want to get rid of. And the Lord will take them off your hands and do, do away with them if you let him. You know, after taking inventory, there's things that are worth something. And then we find out there's things that are not really worth keeping. And whatever is not worth keeping, let go and get rid of, give it to the Lord. And whatever there is worth keeping, guess what? Give it to the Lord. It's all his anyway, right? Now, take inventory. Take inventory. What kind of fish, what kind of loaves do you have? If you don't think you have much, you know what? Maybe you've got to look again. If you don't know how much you have, God won't bless you. You've got to take inventory. You've got to find out. You have to take inventory. Givers must first take an inventory of what is in their heart before taking inventory of what's in their pantry, what's in the closet, what's in the garage. You gotta take inventory of what's in your heart. And that's what the Lord wanted them to do. He really wanted them to take inventory of their heart. You know, you give. But then he comes to the practical. How many loaves do you have? Take some inventory. Here's another principle. Organization makes it easier to give. In verses 39 and 40, it says, Jesus commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass, and they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, here's, here's a principle right here that you know, I want you to hold on to. The Lord blesses what is organized. He blesses what is organized. God is a God of order. He's not a God of confusion. He doesn't bless sloppiness and disorder and just, you know, all that mess. He doesn't bless that. He blesses order. And so provision is more easily and regularly distributed through organization. God wants us to care for and make sure everyone will have enough. He wants to make sure that, hey, you've got to be organized to do that. That no one is overlooked. You know, when you're reading through the one-year Bible and you get, to, you get to those books where it's just all the so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. 
All those names are important to the Lord. Every single one of them, every single name here is important to the Lord. He doesn't want anyone to be overlooked. Now, tonight, just like what happened there, we're going to meet out on the grass. We're going to assemble on the grass out in Auburn, at the park in Auburn. We're going to assemble on the grass, but we're going to be under a big tent. So don't worry if it rains. We got, we got plenty of coverage. We were there Friday night, and it was, I believe it was raining a little bit, or Wednesday, and uh, the, it's really dry underneath that tent. Now, we're going to meet, for those who are serving, those who want to serve at the Tent of Meeting Revival tonight, tomorrow night, and the next night, we, we want you to be there by 6 o'clock. And it's all about heaven's gates and hell's flames. That starts at 7. But be there at 6 o'clock if you want to serve. And you'll be put in a place to serve. And there's all sorts of areas to serve. There's organization out there. There's churches involved to where they're putting people in charge of the parking lot. To where people pull in, there's organization. People are pointing to them where to park, you know, and to get as many cars in there safely as they can. And then they even got, they provide a, a, a golf cart to take people to the tent. That's organization. There's people that are going to be working in the, in the children's ministry. They're going to be watching the kids and keeping that all organized. That's going to be fun to do. And that's organization. There's people who are going to be working at the altar and they're going to be praying for others. And there's going to be cards that people fill out just so there's names that are, we find out what people's names are so we can do follow up and connect with them. You know what? That's organization. And I really believe that God is going to do something miraculous out there tonight and tomorrow night and the next night and then next weekend with the youth revival because it's organized. It's organized. And if you think, oh, it's too late or don't make any excuses, it's not too late to go out there and be part of it. If you can't serve, that's all right. You can serve in a different way. You can provide someone a ride out there. Take a family with you out there. Take people out there and just, people won't know. I find out when you invite people and you provide the ride, they're a lot more likely to go. Say, I'll pick you up at 6.30 and we'll go. And so take them out there. You can be part of it. Now, you must have organization in order to prepare people to receive from the Lord. That's all that's to it. That's really, the church is an organization. You're an organization. And what we do is we prepare people to receive from the Lord. That's what it's all about. And that's what the disciples were doing on that day. And you can be part of that tonight. It's never too late. It's not too late. You can still do it. Here's another thing. Give thanks to God for what you have. Give thanks. We sang that this morning, give thanks. In verse 41, it says, Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave him thanks and broke the loaves. Now that's an appreciation of the resources that God's given you. Now Jesus gave thanks. That should tell us something. Now if the Lord Jesus is giving thanks for a little bit of bread and a little fish, how much more should we give thanks to the Father in heaven for what we have, the clothes on our back, the, the gas in our tank, amen, the, the, the power in our sockets that we can plug in and uh, the refrigerator and we can keep that fish in the, in the freezer and it'll stay good. No matter what you have, a lot or just a little, thank God for it. Thank the Lord for it. Because all good things come from Him. Thank Him for it. It's all about your attitude. You know, have you ever had someone just expect you to give? To come up to you and just expect you to give? Maybe your kids, they expect you to give. Or people feel entitled like you should give something to them. Have you ever had that happen to you? Where you just kind of got an uneasy feeling like, why do you feel entitled? You know, you kind of get that. Now, that might be a little bit of your flesh. 
Uh, but you probably felt that way at times, right? You know? But it's totally different when people are grateful, isn't it? It's really different. God really blesses those who are grateful. You know, we thank Him for what we have, not for what we don't have, right? I mean, you can thank Him for not having certain things you don't want, but mainly we thank Him for what He's blessed us with and what He's given us. Thank Him. And start with what you have. And you might realize that your inventory is a whole lot larger than what you thought it was. You know, don't complain about what you don't have. Thank Him for what you do have. You might not have much, but you probably have more than what you think. You know, every person that lives in this country has a lot more than uh, other countries, especially third world countries. You'd be surprised how much we have. You know, it's, it's what has God given to me? What has God given to you to take care of? What do you have in your house, in your storage, in your attic, in your yard? What are your assets? Not for me to know, but for you to know yourself so you can thank God for what you have. And when you know exactly what you have, God will begin to bless you. He will begin to bless you. And when you're thankful, you realize, man, I got a lot more than what I really thought I had. And you stop looking at what you don't have, and you start really focusing on what God's already given you. And there you go. That's, that's where uh, a miraculous uh, miracle can happen. A, a, a miracle of generosity could that's where it just springs from, being thankful. Another principle is God will keep giving to those in his di distribution chain. In verse 41, it says, Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. Now, Distribution of resources. That's all about serving, right? That's serving, you'll discover your purpose. Resources need people willing to distribute them, right? Now, last Friday, we gave away snow cones right here at the church. It was the last day of school, and all the kids were, were on the streets, and we gave away a lot of snow cones. Uh, I know it was over 100. I think it probably was probably over a couple hundred snow cones that we gave away. Now, we, we distributed them to the community. We gave them to the community. And right now, we, everyone's noticed that the supply chain is not like it used to be, right? It's broken compared to what it used to be before, you know, pre-COVID, right? The supply chain is broken. Well, there's times where I believe the Lord thinks that, man, the supply chain is broken in my church. You know, where people don't want to be part of the chain, the supply chain to keep things moving, keep things going. And when that happens, well, God just shuts that down. He says, I'm going to go over here and use them to distribute. I want them part of the supply chain. They kind of give, keep giving out. And that's what the disciples did. When the Lord gave them the bread and the fish, they didn't hold, it on, hold on to it for themselves. They didn't just, you know, hold on to it. They gave it. They gave it to the, to the others that were there. They kept giving it out, giving it out. And when you give it out, you'd be surprised at how much you get back at the end. Amen. But God wants someone to be part of the supply chain. He wants us to be part of the di distribution factor in getting it to people. Now, we, always, we, we can ask God to give all the time. Well, God, do something, do something. And God's saying, well, come on. Help me. You know, I want you to be part of the process. I want you to pass it out. I'm going to give it to you, and then I want you to pass it out. God wants you to be a giver like him. A giver, not a taker. A contributor, not a consumer. A distributor, not a devourer. He wants to bless you so you can bless others. Isn't that good? Be part of the supply chain. You know, our God will supply all of our needs through Christ Jesus, right? He will supply it all. 
Just like there, he supplied, Jesus supplied it. And, just, and the disciples kept giving it up. That's what we do as disciples of, of Christ. Another principle is be resourceful with all God has given you. Mark 6, 42 and 43 says, They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. Now, one of the principles of receiving more from the Lord is not to waste what he has already given you. I had a friend that I don't even think he was saved. It was, this was years ago. He, he, was, he came from a rich family and everything, and then he, he went on his own. and It was almost like the prodigal son, but he... He shared a story with me one time that I never forgot. He was, he was driving down the road, and I believe I did it too, but he, he just brought the story back. What he shared with me is he had all the money he wanted. He had a car. He had everything. And for some reason, he was just eating a Big Mac. He got a Big Mac, and he, was eating, he took one bite out of that Big Mac, and he's like, eh, and he threw it out the window, and that was it. So like, I'll get another one. And he told me when he did, it, when he did that that day, all of a sudden, he came into financial lack, just right after that. And he struggled and struggled and struggled. And he told me he learned a lesson that never waste anything. And once he, he said, once he learned that lesson, everything started coming back to him. And he wasn't even saved. He wasn't even a Christian. He wasn't even a Christian following the Lord or anything. This is just a secular guy who threw out a Big Mac. Now, how many times do we throw something away? You know, whether it's food or whether it's just, one time I was at a football game, I was standing in line, and the young ladies in front of me dropped a bunch of change, and it, a lot of them were quarters. And I'm standing behind, and I noticed they weren't bending down to pick it up. And I thought, well, maybe, something, maybe they didn't hear. I said, excuse me, you dropped some change there. And they turned around and looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah, whatever, I'm not gonna, you know, you can have it. I'm like, you're not gonna pick that up? And they're like, no. You know, like, like it was all like a way below them to pick that up. So I reached down, I picked all that change up, and I had it in my hand, and I showed them, I'm like, you sure you don't want it? Here it is, and they're like, no. And I'm like, hmm. I was able to buy everything that I wanted in line that day for, just because I was humble enough to pick that up. And at the football games, when we pick up the trash, it just blows my mind how many people will take one sip out of a pop or out of a bottle of water and then throw it on the ground. It just blows my mind. When you waste things, when you're not resourceful, God's not going to bless that. Be resourceful, uh, and to do that, you really need a budget. Have a budget. 10% more for giving, 30% figure out paying taxes or whatever with that 30, 20% invest, 40% live on the rest, you know? Your basic needs, your housing, your food, your essentials. If you don't have enough, look for where there could be waste. If you, find, if you don't have enough, that's a sign that there's some waste. George Mueller, who took care of orphans, thousands of orphans through the years, he said, if, you, if your need isn't being met, look for the waste. And whenever he, he looked, when the need wasn't being met, he found waste and he corrected it, and then there was a miraculous generosity that happened that the Lord brought about. If you have a need, look for the waste. But, you know, be resourceful and eliminate the waste. Don't, don't wait till you don't have anything to do that. Start now. The sixth thing is be, uh, expect. Expectations of miracles start with the Lord is our provider. In Mark 6, 51 and 52, it says they were totally amazed for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. See, if your hearts are too hard to really understand the miracle of the loaves, everything I'm telling you here today, then it's going to be hard for you to take this in. 
It's going to be hard for you to, to really accept this whole generosity message. But when they went to the other side of the lake, Jesus got out and healed everybody. See, when you fully understand and trust that God is your provider, it's much more likely that you're going to experience a miracle of generosity. Whether it's financial, whether it's healing, what, whatever it may be, you're more likely to experience a miracle when you realize the Lord is our provider. Now, when you put Christ as Lord over your life and put him in that position, it eliminates a lot of doubt and disbelief in your life. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. If you apply these, these seven things uh, to your life and just take this story, this history of what happened and how Jesus showed them what to do to really experience miraculous generosity in their lives, I know if you do that, you apply it to your lives, that you will experience the same. God's no respecter of person, and you're a disciple of Christ. So this, you can have miraculous generosity happen in your life if you just apply these principles. So let's stand. And really it starts with you just letting the Lord know that you acknowledge that everything belongs to Him. It starts right there. So with just with, with uh, heads bowed, eyes closed, maybe you put your hands to heaven and, and you just say something like this, Father God, we acknowledge that you own it all. I acknowledge, Lord, that everything belongs to you. The cattle on a thousand hills, the, the hills themselves, Lord. Lord, the, the, the money in my pocket, Lord, the, the car in my garage. Lord, the food in my fridge, Lord, it all belongs to you. The, the money in the bank, Lord, it all belongs to you. And Father, forgive me for for the sin of just uh, holding back or making excuses, Lord, or, 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 or not really being part of the, the supply chain. Lord, forgive me for that. And I want, I, want to, I want to trust you in everything. Lord, and I want to give when you say to give. Lord, I proclaim you as Jesus as Lord over my life. I believe, Jesus, that you suffered and died and paid the price for the debt of my sin. Lord, and I believe with all my heart that you rose from the dead. So with saying that, Lord, I believe that you want to work through me to be generous to others. And I want to serve you all my days and see a miracle of generosity happen, Lord, through me through us, through this church. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we want to see more miracles like these, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, Lord. We trust in you, Lord, and we want you to work through us and with us, Lord. And we surrender to you in your mighty name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen.